Okay. Hi, everyone. I know everyone's starting to trickle in a bit. Um, let me give it another minute before we get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I know it's kind of tough the day after a long weekend, but I don't know. I feel like long weekends have a completely different meaning in this world that we're in today. Uh, Sarah, I feel like your shirt's going to put everybody in a super positive mood today. That was my intention. Spring. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the two of us together are totally bringing spring in. That, it's a dress, actually. It's like head to toe. <laughs> All right. Um, I think you're going to keep trickling in. Uh, let's just get started. So uh, we're hosting our next installment of our speaker series. And today we're gonna to be talking about nutrition and fertility. Before we dive into the topic at hand, um, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Amy Devania. I'm the CEO and co-founder of UVA. We're an at-home fertility diagnostic that monitors two hormones, luteinizing hormone and progesterone through your urine. We quantitatively measure these hormones and um, determine when your most fertile days are and also confirm if you ovulated. Our test is completely personalized, so we don't wait for your hormones to reach some arbitrary threshold. We capture your baseline levels and then detect fluctuations by comparing to that. In addition, we don't, you don't have to mail samples to a lab or visit a clinic to interpret your results. We provide you with that lab grade, uh, lab quality results in the privacy of your own home. And if you're interested in more information, you can check out our website at uva.life. And just some quick housekeeping points, we're going to be having a short presentation by our guest speaker, followed by a Q&A. If you have questions during the talk, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. At the end, we'll, we will be doing a consultation with our raffle winner on their food habits and ways to optimize their fertility. Um, now today, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the effects of nutrition and fertility. And I'm thrilled to have Dara God Godfrey join us to discuss the importance of nutrition in our fertility journeys. A quick intro on you, Dara. Um, Dara is a highly esteemed registered di dietitian at RMA of New York. After being a patient herself at RMA, struggling with PCOS and ultimately conceiving two children via IVF, she knew her passion was working in women's health and fertility. Over 10 years later, her lifestyle driven approach has helped support hundreds of patients' nutritional goals at every stage of infertility treatment and pregnancy. Dara, thank you so much for joining us today and I'm gonna give you the floor. Amy, that was a beautiful introduction. Thanks so much. I am so thrilled to be here today to speak about a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, as Amy mentioned, um, I had my own fertility struggles, which um, actually led me to the fertility clinic RMA where I work. And uh, 11 years later, I'm still really enjoying um, meeting with, with women, and men throughout their fertility journey. And today um, I'll be discussing some of the most important um, ways to help prepare you going into a pregnancy and helping with overall fertility. And I think, you know, an, an interesting place to start is, is about yourself, making yourself a priority. I think, um, you know, this past year has been challenging for us all in one way, shape or form. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of us have taken a backseat of, of not necessarily taking care of our own health, our own lifestyle. Um, but now more than ever, it's important to make yourself and your health a priority. And it doesn't need uh, to be difficult or challenging. Even a couple simple uh, tips and tools can really help you um, maximize your health, your energy and hopefully help in your fertility journey. So um, the, the first place I always like to begin, um, which is actually not typical of, of what a dietitian speaks about, because you know, what I like to, to discuss is, is discuss food. Um, but I think it's great to always start speaking about prenatal vitamins. 
because I think it's a really good thing to start off with um, when you're thinking about starting a family. And, um, you know, I don't like to rely on supplements overall to be the first line of resort to get all your vitamins and minerals. I'm, I'm definitely for uh, food, but I do think it's great to have a prenatal vitamin to have that safety net um, on the days where you can't get in um, all your fruits and vegetables and your, and your vitamins that really are important um, to help prepare for a pregnancy and going into a pregnancy. So that's a great place to start. And, um, you know, a lot of people over the years have asked me um, what to look for in a prenatal vitamin. And for me, there's a couple of things that I think are very important. Number one, the reason why we need to take prenatal vitamins is for uh, folate or folic acid. Um, and because that's important going into a pregnancy to help prevent neural tube defects. Um, so a lot of these prenatal vitamins, they may say folic acid, they may say folate. Folic acid is a synthetic form of folate. Folate is a food form. Um, and I typically suggest going for something called a methylated folate, um, which is a more bioavailable form, which is easier to, um, for the majority of, of the population to process properly. So there's a couple of brands that I like um, that have the methylated folate, one being um, Nature Made Prenatal with DHA. Uh, another product I like is called Zoller, Z-A-H-L-E-R, prenatal with DHA. And then someone recently showed me a, a new product which I thought was interesting called Parallel Health, um, where you can have, um, they, they give you different prenatals throughout your, your journey. Um, but as you can see, they, they all have DHA in it. So not only do they have a methylated folate, they also have DHA, which is an omega-3 fatty acid which um, I think is very important for overall health and fertility. And then the last thing that I look for in a good quality prenatal is vitamin D. Most of us, I'm not sure where everyone's tuning in from, but if you know, we're on the East Coast, if you're on the East Coast, you're somewhere where it's cold weather, cold location, we're probably not getting enough vitamin D. Also past year when we were all cooped up indoors, probably lowish in vitamin D. And vitamin D is a, a vitamin that's been um, widely uh, researched for its connection to fertility, conception, pregnancy, and all three of those, and I have zero affiliation to any of them, but you know, they all do check the box and that they do con contain vitamin D. Make sure to take your prenatal vitamin. Most people often take vitamins first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. I suggest actually taking it after you've eaten because a lot of those vitamins in there are fat soluble. That means that you need some food or some fat to help absorb them optimally. So that's great. Start with a great foundation, a prenatal that has your methylated folate, your vitamin D, your DHA. Now let's talk about food because that's, you know, that's my area of expertise and really um, uh, an area I think that everyone can easily focus on. And I think a great way to start is to speak about protein. Um, and this is something that I've seen over the years that a lot of my female patients are falling short on. And this is not to say that you need to eat like a bodybuilder and, you know, eat two big chicken breasts every day for lunch um, and a big steak for dinner. But the idea of having a source of protein at every meal can be very um, helpful for number one, helping to control your blood sugars. So keeping you feeling full and satisfied longer. So you're not getting blood sugar rushes and then dips and crashes. Protein actually helps to stabilize your blood sugar, especially when you're eating some carbohydrates at your meal. Um, and then the other thing is protein is the building blocks of our, of our body, of our cells. So in order for our cells to grow and thrive, they depend on protein. Um, so I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, do I need to be eating more animal protein? You can get protein from a variety of sources. And for me, my philosophy is um, having the variety. Um, so, you know, if someone isn't vegetarian, going for um, a, a pasture raised organic poultry, you know, poultry, chicken, turkey, going for grass fed beef, if you can, going for wild um, fish and shellfish, um, for more of a, a vegetarian front. Uh, going for an omega-3 fortified egg. Uh, nuts and seeds are something that I, I push a lot for fertility, um, but they're also a nice source of protein. Um, in terms of dairy products, uh, I'll get a little bit more into it later, but 
you know, going for a, a good quality full fat dairy product is another source of, of getting in protein. And so are things like beans and legumes like lentils and organic tofu and tempeh. So many ways to get protein, but really important to try to get a source of protein for every single meal, including snacks. Um, so that's a great foundation. The next thing, vegetables. Big surprise, but eating your greens is so important now. And it's interesting to see that I feel like most Americans are lacking on the veggie front. Another, an easy way to think about it is, is make 50% of your plate minimum twice a day to have some form of vegetable. So I, I think of you know having two types of vegetables on your plate for lunch and two types of vegetables on your plate for dinner. Why veggies? Um, not only are they jam-packed with vitamins and minerals, vitamin C, which could be great for your immune system, um, which is very important. They're also, um, you know, high, they can be high in beta carotene, they can be high in antioxidants, um, but they're also, a, a, you know, many vegetables are a great source of fiber. And fiber, if, you know, anyone who's on a, a prenatal vitamin and is already experiencing some constipation because of the added iron in a prenatal vitamin, veggies can help, help with that, can help keep things moving because they're, they're a nice source of fiber. So I really do think, um, you know, my, my first line is think of green vegetables, but I do think, think of rainbow, rainbow filled vegetables. So whether it's spinach, broccoli, um, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, those are actually all great sources of folate, which I mentioned before is so important going into a pregnancy. Um, but you know, all vegetables can give you something, whether it's peppers or mushrooms, um, whether it's grilled or cooked or sauteed raw or steamed. I do often suggest um, if you're experiencing more constipation or stomach distress or you know, a sensitive stomach, cook your vegetables. Vegetables are actually best absorbed with a source of fat at that meal. It doesn't have to be on the vegetables, but whether you, you know, dip it with some hummus or guacamole or you sprinkle some nuts or seeds, that the fat actually helps you absorb a lot of those vitamins in the vegetables. So as I mentioned, 50%, if not 75% of your plate twice a day should consist of, of vegetables. Think of first the greens, the green vegetables, and then you can always balance it out with some other um, colorful vegetables as well. Um, the, the third thing I wanted to speak about is um, the importance of fat and not to fear fat. And I'm thrilled to see in like, you know, the keto diet day and age, even though, you know, my philosophy is all about balance that all macronutrients, protein, fats, and carbs all serve a purpose in your diet. But I think fat for at least my generation has gotten a bad reputation in the past. You know, the, the idea of the skim or fat-free milk, um, the idea of having the eggs, the egg whites, as opposed to the yolk, um, you know, being fearful of, of nuts and seeds and nut butters but fat is really important. Um, you know, number one, it also fills you up, similar to protein, um, eating them when you do eat carbohydrates coming from, you know, breads or, or grains or fruits. When you eat a source of fat and protein with it, it can actually keep you feeling fuller longer and help stabilize your blood sugars. And that ultimately can be helpful for your, your fertility hormones. They're all connected and linked. Um, so, don't be afraid of including some fat in your diet. Yes, serving sizes are important. A handful of nuts, a quarter of an avocado, one or two eggs. Um, and it's interesting because some of these foods can overlap with proteins and fat. Um, the one thing also I wanted to kind of hone in on is the importance of omega-3 fatty acids. As I mentioned before, prenatal vitamin should have a, a source of omega-3s coming from DHA. But the good thing is you can also get it from a wide variety of foods that are high in healthy fats and these omega-3s. Um, think of fatty fishes like um, salmon, trout, sardines, anchovies, but you can also get it from non-fish sources, from seaweed, from omega-3 fortified eggs, from chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts. Those are all um, really good sources of omega-3s. Um, and there's a lot of research behind the benefit of omega-3s for fertility and also during pregnancy. And I always tell you know, patients, it's good to get in the habit of getting some of those sources in every, every week, because it's also important for a baby's brain and eye development. Who doesn't want a smart baby that has good eyesight? So get in your omega-3s um, 
throughout the week. And really of all the fishes, I think a lot of people are afraid of, of fish in general because of mercury levels. The good news is salmon and trout are much lower on the mercury list compared to things like um, you know, ahi tuna or shark or um, I'm forgetting a couple other ones, mackerel um, or swordfish. Um, but something like a salmon is much lower. And I really do feel like the benefits outweigh the potential minimal risks. Um, so fat, very important, um, something that you should try to include every day. Um, and then the last component, which I think kind of ties everything together, which I think also gets lost, is the importance of staying hydrated. I'm thrilled that we're speaking um, in the spring, summer, coming into the summer months where naturally we typically crave more liquid rich, you know, fruits and vegetables and foods um, and also wanna stay hydrated because we're sweating more. But I think no matter what, we really, I really do like to, to stress the importance of staying hydrated. You can definitely overdo it with too much uh, water, but the idea of, trying to get in about eight to 12 cups of water a day. Eight cups is really great going into a pregnancy. If you are actively going through a fertility treatment, your needs do go a little, are a little bit higher because the medicine, the medications, many of the med medications for the treatment um, can be quite dehydrating. So focusing on water, seltzer water. If water gets boring, put in some sliced strawberries, some mint, uh, some sliced oranges or, um, you know, you can make it fun and put frozen grapes inside. Um, seltzer water is fine as well. And like an herbal tea can be good too. And a lot of people ask me, um, you know, is herbal tea safe? And I wish there was more research on that, but generally going for um, a basic herbal tea should be fine. But what I typically do is like, I'm drinking tea tonight and I wish you can see, I can't really, I have some sliced orange, some sliced lemon peel, a cinnamon stick. So I've kind of made an, sometimes I put in mint. So having some, um, you know, homemade tea can also be a, a great way to get in your, your eight to 12 cups a day. Um, but it's also important, the reason why I do stress the water is because water helps you digest the other things that I mentioned, the fats, the proteins, the fiber. Um, water does help move things along. And as I mentioned, the iron in your prenatal vitamin can be quite constipating. Water can help move things along. And typically, you know, a lot of us are um, nowadays are going more to, um, you know, in terms of trying to, to be good for the environment, we're not using as many plastics, which I think is great. Um, I would caution against too many uh, plastic water bottles, just because there's um, BPA in the lining, which, especially when it's hot out, you go outside, you're carrying a bottle of water, the sun is, is beating down on that water bottle. And when it's activated with heat, the, it leaches the, the plastics into the water. And that we're seeing more now through research that that can be um, something that may impair our, um, our ability to conceive. So um, if you can, uh, I like glass bottles. And I'm not against tap water. I think New York is pretty good, but you know, the idea if you want to, to have a, a filtered uh, water, tap water, that could be good as well. Um, but either way, just drink water. Uh, a great thing to maybe set a goal to make it more realistic is to break it up throughout the day. So I typically suggest two cups of water for breakfast, two cups of water before lunch or by lunchtime. So you're getting in half at least by lunch. And then two cups, you pair it with your afternoon snack and two cups at dinner time. And that makes it seem less overwhelming. So two cups is 16 ounces. So by lunchtime, you're gonna get your 32, which is your one liter. And then by dinner time, you can reach your, your 64, which is your eight. And again, if someone is going through a uh, fertility treatment or during a pregnancy, those needs do go up to about 12 cups of water. Good news is you can get it from other sources of, of water rich foods, watermelon, which we're definitely getting to watermelon season. Soups are another way of um, also staying hydrated. And I briefly want to speak about coffee and um, black tea. So anything that's caffeinated, a lot of people ask me, what's their thoughts on caffeine? And for me, caffeine in general can be somewhat dehydrating. So I don't want any caffeinated drink to be consumed in replacement of your water. It should be consumed in addition to your water. So I'm not against coffee. I'm, I'm actually, for me, I'm, my concern is more of 
how we're drinking it. Are we drinking on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, which most of us do. Eat something first, eat a handful of nuts and then go for your coffee. But the other thing is, so you don't forget to drink your water, have two sips of water for every sip of coffee. And that way it can help remind you to keep hydrated and not get too dehydrated from the caffeine. But I do think the idea of having some a handful of nuts or some other source of protein before you go for your coffee is a great segue into a pregnancy when, you know, why do we drink caffeine? We drink caffeine because it gives us energy. And, you know, if we're feeling those effects, a growing baby can feel those effects that much more so. So the idea of having some food in your system, some water in your system can really be helpful in terms of, um, you know, making sure that, that mom and baby are, are healthy. Um, the other thing, which I, I like to speak about, food's very important, but food is a, a fraction of our overall lifestyle. And I, I, I do like to, to, you know, really speak about the importance of sleep because you can eat all the good food in the world, but if you're not getting good quality sleep, your body, the, the food won't be used as efficiently as possible in your body. So, you know, I'm sure most of us have heard we need to get the on average seven to, to eight hours of sleep. Yes, I think that's important, but it's also the quality and the quality past midnight is exponentially not as beneficial and restorative as if we were to go to bed prior to midnight. So I think, you know, going to bed 10, 11, 11.30 the latest really should be a great habit for people to get into because that really good restorative REM sleep happens around 12 to one. If you're going to bed at 12 and maybe you don't fall asleep right away and it takes a while to get into that really deep restorative sleep, you're missing out on that. When that happens, Cortisol levels go up. If anyone knows what cortisol levels, it's a stress hormone, um, which naturally does go up at nighttime, but it can go up a lot more than our body really needs to. And what ends up happening is we wake up, our cortisol levels are still high, and cortisol actually makes us crave more sweet stuff, more sweets. And I'm not anti-carbohydrates, but it's usually making us crave the white bread, the cookies, the cakes, the fried foods. Um, which are fine on occasion, but if it's becoming a habit, sometimes that can be, um, that can happen because of poor quality sleep. Um, I also think to get in a good sleep groove um, is to have good sleep habits, you know, an hour before. And that means, this is the hardest part, shutting off electronics, <laughs> um, ideally an hour before bed, but even 30 minutes before bed um, and get into a new uh, bedtime routine dim the lights a little bit so you're already adjusting to a darker mood. Um, whether you read before bed, which I think is wonderful, whether I, I highly recommend a mindfulness practice. So that could be reading, that could be having a gratitude journal, which I actually just started doing and it's changed my life. And you know, there's many gratitude journals out there, but it could be something as simple as on a piece of paper every night, you write one or two things that you're grateful for that day. And just the act of doing that can naturally calm our body and really help us ease into a much calmer, happier sleep. Um, or meditation. Nowadays, there's so many great meditation apps that are out there that we can use. Um, there's Calm, there's Headspace. Inside Timer, I often recommend to people who want something free. But in these, um, in these apps, there's many different um, sleeping specific meditations that can be really helpful. Um, so sleep, very, 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 very helpful for, for our overall body, um, a mindfulness practice, nutrition, and then being active. And active can mean so many things to different people, but the idea of getting moving every single day. And my philosophy, for the most part, I like to customize depending on who I'm working with, but you know, just the idea of getting moving, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, or the escalator, going for walks. Um, you know, if you practice yoga or Pilates, that's great. I do caution, and this is where it really is a customized, no, there's no one size fits all approach. I do think a run or a higher intensity workout can be a great stress reliever, which um, can be wonderful for us. But I often do um, caution against when I see people doing a lot of high intensity exercise, not always, but for some people that can create more inflammation in their system. And that's something that we wanna to try to reduce 
um, when we're trying to get pregnant. So part of it is, is feeling your body, listening to your body, realizing how you feel the next day, physically, mentally, um, and, and, and customizing it based on your needs and where you are in your fertility journey. Um, so I hope that wasn't too much information or too little information, but I know we, there's so many questions um, that I saw that you all sent in, and I would love to um, get a chance to answer them all. Yeah, thanks, Dara. Uh, that was really helpful. So we did get a lot of questions um, prior to the event, but if you guys have questions, feel free to drop them into the, um, the chat box here and Dara can answer them in real time. Um, but Dara, if it's okay, I'll start kind of throwing these questions at you. Perfect. Um, that's fine, my thing. Okay. Uh, so the first one is, uh, can gluten intolerance impact infertility? I love that question because I do, I feel like almost on a daily basis, I have um, someone either coming to me um, and they're on a gluten-free diet or gluten-free plan, or I get the question, you know, I have PCOS, endometriosis, underactive thyroid, or I'm just trying to get pregnant. Should I, um, should I get rid of all gluten, uh, gluten containing foods? And by gluten, it's wheat, rye, barley, and oats. Nowadays, you can find gluten-free oats, but those are um, the main um, contributors um, to um, that, that give you gluten that have the, the proteins in it that um, cannot be great for, for some people. For me, if someone is diagnosed with celiac disease, that for me is, in my opinion, a non-negotiable to go on a gluten-free diet and a quite strict gluten-free diet. Thank goodness we live in an era where there, we have access to so many different types of gluten-free alternatives. But I'm always a little cautious when it comes to people with gluten intolerance or people who believe they have some gluten sensitivity. I do think the American, uh, you know, the, the pastas, the breads that we're given in America um, aren't of great quality. And I think it could be tied to gluten. It could be tied to something else. Um, so I'm not against people who want to go gluten-free, but I do always caution that just because you're going gluten-free doesn't necessarily mean that it's a healthier alternative. Because I, what I often find is you look at the gluten-free alternative breads or pastries or, or whatnot, and they have like 20 times the ingredients that a, a simple sourdough bread or a whole wheat bread or a pumpernickel bread would have. And so, you know, if you're going in with the intention of, oh, this is going to be a healthier alternative for me, I, I don't think it's necessarily better. I, ask, I often caution against my, my PCOS patients, especially anyone who has any blood sugar instability um, concerns, to be careful when it comes to gluten-free alternatives. You want to go for something that's much higher in fiber, that doesn't have a lot of ingredients like brown rice syrup, or um, I see a lot of tapioca starch. Those are other names for carbohydrate or, or potato starch. Those are just other names for um, fillers that are very carbohydrate dense that can often be much higher in carbohydrates, which, which break down into sugars, than a simple piece of bread. So it's not necessarily a healthier alternative. Granted, um, if you do notice you eat pasta and you eat pizza, you eat bread, and your body doesn't feel great afterwards, you may be gluten sensitive. And that could be a great way to um, uh, switch over to a gluten-free uh, lifestyle. Just keep in mind, gluten-free does not always mean a, a healthier option. So I wish I can give a definitive, don't go gluten-free or go gluten-free. For me, um, listen to your body. And I think that's an interesting and a hard thing for, for us to do is really be in tune of, is this really making my body feel good physically and mentally, but especially physically? Um, and if it's not, whether it's gluten containing or, or you know, it's a void of gluten, um, that may not be the best choice for you. Thanks for that. Uh, that's really helpful. Um, another question that I got, and I, I get this a lot from a lot of our users, um, how, do you have any tips on how to lose weight from IVF? Um, this woman has gained a significant amount of weight in the past six months. So yeah, I, I see, um, I see a lot of people, or I, I work with a lot of people who come to see me after a number of, of um, unfortunate failed attempts of IVF, and, and they're not only, you know, um, high anxiety, stress because of um, 
of the fertility struggles, rightfully so, but also because they've gained a lot of weight. Um, and it's not something that I see all the time, but it is something that I see often. And my approach for weight loss is doing it in a healthy way. And I, ha and I do work with people um, to, to lose weight throughout their fertility journey. Um, but I, I'm, my approach is much more, what are the things that you should be including in your day-to-day -day routine more so than the things that you should be avoiding? Um, and as I mentioned, those things that, I, that we spoke, I spoke about before, the protein, so important to eat at every single meal. Uh, making sure that you drink your two, two um, liters of water every single day. Making sure that half of your plate, if not 75% of your plate consists of uh, vegetables. Those are all tools that can be great for your overall health fertility, but that can also support weight loss. When it comes to carbohydrates, I, I didn't really touch too much upon carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are important. They're fuel for our body. They're, they're um, energy for our brain. However, the standard American diet, which is very sad, is much more carbohydrate dominant than you know, fats and proteins and veggie dominant. So I typically say, if you're gonna go for carbohydrates, you do wanna go for the better quality, for the whole grains, for the beans, for the, you know, the starchy vegetables, like the sweet potatoes. If you're gonna have potatoes, go for the skin. Um, and making sure that it takes up no more than 25% of your plate. So if you heard before I mentioned, make 50 to 75% be vegetables and 25% be protein. If you're choosing your 50% your to be vegetables, 25% protein, that last 25% will go towards your carbohydrates. Um, for some people who've gained a lot of weight, sometimes I'll say, you know, maybe choose it once a day for lunch or dinner, your carbohydrates. But the other meal, it will be 75% vegetables and protein. So you're skipping the, the whole grains or the beans. Um, but, you know, for me, it's not a one size fits all. I don't like things that are too restrictive. Listen to your body. If you're very active, you do need more carbohydrates to help you refuel properly. Um, I also didn't really go into detail about fiber, but fiber is my favorite carbohydrate of which most people are lacking. Um, starting your morning off with fiber is crucial with your protein. Flax seeds, chia seeds, oatmeal, um, a fiber cereal, a fiber cracker, you know, paired with some peanut butter um, or cottage cheese. Um, very important to, to make sure that you're getting in the, the fiber because fiber fills you up it won't spike your blood sugar levels um, as fast as something like white bread or, or white rice or potatoes. Um, those foods don't need to be eliminated, but in terms of weight loss, they shouldn't be an everyday food. You know, a couple times a week paired with a protein is a great approach to help with weight loss. So that's a long answer. If there's anything specific that you want me to add that you, you have a question about, Feel free so, uh, to it, add that. To it the turns chat out that the person that asked that question actually put some comments in the chat box. Ooh, um, so I'll just okay. read those out, out loud. Um, I've gained 40 pounds in four months due to IBS. I just had yeah. endosurgery and now I'm losing some weight. I lost 10 pounds. I exercise 45 minutes a day and watch what I eat. However, I am 42 and my surgeon says that my window is three to six months after endosurgery, where I am in my prime to get pregnant. So yeah. We are trying naturally, but my go to IUI in one to two months. What happens if I don't lose the weight? IVF doctors say that you shouldn't have a high BMI and now minus 28. Also, why do you need to eat protein in every meal? <laughs> wow, great question. So let's the first tackle the protein. The protein in every meal is important because, you know, I generally suggest about 50 to 60 grams of protein a day. Um, and I think it's important to break it up because protein can always be eaten by itself, but most of us typically eat, eat carbohydrates at every meal in the form of bread, potatoes, rice, you know, whole grains, which is great if you can, fruit, um, which is, they're all, they're, they're important to have, but when we eat carbohydrates by themselves, our blood sugars go up and they go up much faster, which is often why we eat them. The pancakes, the waffles, the toast, it gives us that quick acne energy, but as fast as that, your blood sugar rises and it gives you that energy, it falls and you get the opposite effects. You get hangry, you get, you know, your blood sugars are low and, and you end up craving more of them. And that can keep you in that cycle of craving more carbohydrates, feeding into them, and, and then it's dropping. And that can actually lead to, to weight gain in the long term. So the protein is very, is essential at every meal to help blunt those blood sugar effects from rising and, and, and dropping. 
But it's also important because as I mentioned, we need protein in every part of our body. Our cells are made up of protein and we need protein to help keep those cells thriving. Um, so it doesn't need to be a lot. It can be the size of the palm of your hand for a lunch and dinner. It could be the size of the entire, your entire hand and the length and thickness of it. Um, for breakfast, it doesn't have to be anything as big. It could be one to two hard boiled eggs, a handful of nuts and seeds, but I do think it's very important to, to have it at every meal. Let's get back to, in terms of your BMI, I'm not so concerned to be honest with you with your BMI, even though it does put you in that overweight range, it's still, um, it's still not nothing that not not something that I'm I'm overly concerned about. Um, I I get concerned about people losing weight too quickly. People who lose weight more than one to two pounds a week, um, I worry about their long term health because it can be very restrictive. What that may mean is during a pregnancy, your weight gain needs may be a little bit less. You know, if you're if you are in the BMI range of twenty four point nine to um, twenty nine point nine you probably need to gain approximately 15 to 25 pounds. So that would be less than, you know, someone in the normal range, which is um, closer to, you know, 20 to 35 pounds. So that's where you would maybe, uh, you know, cater it during pregnancy. For me, focus on, you know, maybe one pound a week weight loss through the protein, the vegetables, the fiber, and the water. Um, and the exercise, I think that's great that you're doing, you know, for weight loss, the general rule of thumb is 60 minutes, five times a week, 45 minutes is a great start by adding 50 minutes. It could be putting on music and dancing, taking the stairs. It doesn't necessarily have to be a chunk of 60 minutes all at once. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we have uh, several questions about this as well. Um, I'm going to ask the one that was Submitted, but what do you think of intermittent fasting 12 to 14 hours a day when trying to conceive and following a vegetable centric keto diet? So I love that question. Um, there's a lot to say on that, but I'll try to make it uh, quick. Um, I'm always concerned with any type of diet. Any type of diet for me, uh, the term diet is very restrictive. There is something to be said about intermittent fasting because it gives your body a time to rest. However, I'm not sold at this point that it is beneficial for the majority of my female population, um, especially when it comes to fertility. Um, because if it gives you a short, if you're having a short, an, an intermittent fasting, there's many definitions of intermittent fasting. I like the idea of having a window of perhaps eating from nine to six or 10 to seven. I caution against anyone pushing that closer to like a 12 to eight or 12 to nine window of eating, because I don't love people eating too late at night. I don't think that supports overall health doesn't help you wind down at the end of the day when your body needs to digest before bedtime. But I do like the idea of having a window, an earlier window, you know, because we're less active at night. It's great to be eating a little bit earlier in the morning. Um, so intermittent fasting can be helpful, but I think it could be helpful if um, it, it's, it's that um, shorter window. Also, if you're having two meals a day, I get concerned that you're pulling in too many calories at once, which can be very overwhelming and taxing to your kidneys and your liver. So for me, I still like the idea of three meals a day, maybe in that short window span. Um, and that can also help hopefully help you get your vegetables, your protein in. Um, when it comes to a plant-based diet, I think plant-based diet or, or a plant-centric diet is something that I like. Um, what does that mean? Eat more vegetables, which I think most people who I work with who are more vegetarian or vegan, aren't eating enough vegetables. They're relying on a lot of packaged foods. They're relying on a lot of alternative meat sources coming from the Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger, which is quite processed. Fine to have an occasion, but for me, if you are gonna go for, for you know, a, a plant-centric diet, make sure there's lots of plants involved, lots of, of vegetables. And then going for good quality proteins, whether it's coming from eggs, whether it's coming from tofu, organic tofu, organic tempeh, beans, lentils, bean pastas, um, so I do think that, you know, both can be incorporated into a fertility routine, but I think it, um, you know, needs to be well thought out and it can't be too restrictive. Thanks. Um, what are the best ways to support for, oh, I guess you kind of answered this one, the plant-based diet. Um, this is actually a really interesting one. How do you, how do you stay on track with kids, junk food, work events, and healthy meals? By taking a deep breath. <laughs> and realizing that it will be okay. I think it's so interesting. Um, I mean, I, I think this is a very, a much longer discussion, perhaps, you know, a, a whole nother 
topic. Um, but you know what? Taking a deep breath and doing one thing at a time and realizing we are perfect in our imperfections. And, you know, it could seem overwhelming. And I think part of it is, is prioritizing, you know, what needs to be, to, what needs to get done at this moment. But I do think my, at least the, the women that I work with, my patients that are most successful are the ones that plan ahead, whether it's meal prepping, whether it's, you know, going grocery shopping on the weekend and writing down a list. Okay, how many meals am I gonna be home? How many meals do I need? How many vegetables do I need at each meal? And you kind of plan that out when you have a little bit more time, when your kids are on an activity or sleeping or, um, you know, carving that time out. And it doesn't need to be a lot. What I often say is when you're eating one meal, think about what your next meal is going to be like and when it can be. And that way you're not, you know, you're not, you're less reactive and you're more proactive. But you know what? Take it one day at a time. My whole philosophy is progress, not perfection. Um, that's great. And what is, I, I mean, I think you've talked about this a little bit, but maybe I can merge this into another question as well. Um, okay. Can you please share about ideal macros specifically related to carbs? What are the best carbs to eat? I feel like I'm constantly eating vegetables just to meet that 25% ratio. And then we have another question on what is the ideal amount of vegetable portions per day? Well, I recommend three cups minimum a day. I mean, really, my philosophy is unlimited. Have as much as you want, but really for the minimum to really get, um, you know, a lot of your vitamins and minerals, you know, they, they say the, the typical suggestion is five to 10 fruits and vegetables a day. I, um, and that's serving sizes. I do think um, making half of your plate is a great way to think about it twice a day. So that could be a cup or two at lunch, a cup or two at dinner. But, you know, if you're going to have a, a half a plate of broccoli, that's really boring. You know, it's a lot to eat of broccoli. So think of it the way I think about it is, you know, two different types of vegetables per meal time. But that's easy. If you're doing a salad and you're putting, you know, tomatoes, there you go, two vegetables. You can add in, you know, a couple more. That's super easy. Um, in a soup and a vegetable soup, that's another way of, you know, adding a handful of spinach to a tomato soup or a vegetable-based soup. Uh, at dinner time, you know, I always, when I plan my meals for the week, I think about, okay, what two vegetables can I put on my plate? So today I had a salad and I, and I roasted some shiitake mushrooms. Tomorrow I've already planned in my mind, I'm having roasted broccoli and Brussels sprouts. So that's kind of a great way to, to think about it. When it comes to macros, I'm not a macro counter. Why? Because it can become quite obsessive. And also there is no one size fits all. We're all different. Our bodies work differently. Um, you know, I do think, um, I do caution against making your carbohydrate the main focus. So I do think, you know, a, a lot of these macros typically are lowish in protein and fat. And I definitely would boost your proteins. Um, but I don't like to give numbers because then people can become obsessed with it. I'd rather give you a, a you know, a tool of using the palm of your hand, uh, you know, palm or, or your entire hand at length and thickness for the portion of your protein for lunch and the pro uh, portion of your protein at dinner. And the same thing for breakfast, having a source of protein for breakfast. Um, so when you think about it, this is how I kind of split up my day. You want a protein in the morning with a source of fiber and fiber is, is my favorite type of carbohydrate. I mentioned before, chia seeds, flax seeds, um, bran crackers, um, it could be a bran cereal. Lunchtime, you want to look at a, a source of protein and vegetables, and perhaps maybe a carbohydrate there if you like. And that could be uh, a fist worth of beans or a half of a sweet potato. Snack time, proteins is of utmost importance, but you may want to pair a fruit with that. So a fruit and a scoop of almond butter. And then at dinner time, again, the source of protein, your half at least minimum half a plate of vegetables, if not three quarters of your plate of vegetables. And then it depends on, on each person, perhaps another carbohydrate there, especially if someone's very active, if something's not, if someone's not eating for weight loss, perhaps that second carbohydrate. But I'm always gonna suggest you wanna go for whole grains first, brown rice before white rice, quinoa, which is even more nutritious, um, going for roasted potatoes as opposed to fry, you know, French fries. Um, going for uh, roasted corn as opposed to creamed corn. So, you know, th there's varying qualities of carbohydrates, but I don't want people to be afraid of them. For me, the most important thing is if you eat a carbohydrate, make sure there's a protein there that can help stabilize your blood sugar levels and prevent you from craving too much of them throughout the day. 
I'm going to ask you two more questions and then we're Go going ahead. to jump into our, our consult. Um, right. Are there any ways to improve egg quality and prevent miscarriage through nutrition? So, you know, th there is some research behind that. And really, the things that I spoke about today, the foods that I mentioned today are the things that can be helpful. But it's not just food. Food is a piece of the puzzle that can help with fertility, along with, um, you know, you can't get rid of stress, but managing stress, focusing on exercise and, and good sleep. Um, and, you know, depending, every situation is different, you know, it could be a mechanical issue that may be a, a reason why someone's not getting pregnant. But when it comes to food, you want to go for something that gives you the biggest bang for your buck. Vegetables, you get the most out of it, um, you know, in terms of the nutrient dense foods that can really support your health. Protein also can be helpful. Um, you know, there's a great book out there called the Fertility Diet Book, which has a lot of the research to back up foods for fertility. And they do speak about the, the importance of sometimes going for a plant-based uh, diet more so than just meat. Um, and the, the importance of going for foods that are rich in folate, foods that are rich in omega-3s, which we mentioned today, the importance of, go, of, of having fiber. But I wish I could tell someone to eat a food for them to get pregnant or for them to get better egg quality. For me, it's the big picture. It's yes, these little components are important, but it's how we can all try to incorporate them a little bit here and there in our routine that really can be helpful. Right. So that was the question my, on, yes, I think that was the first. The, the last question is um, how big of a factor is alcohol in like pre-pregnancy and we can go into pregnancy as well? Yeah, for me, for pregnancy, the research, um, especially there's, there's a lot of recent research to show, um, you know, the potential harm for, for alcohol during pregnancy. Um, but for me going into pregnancy, it's, it, it goes back to like caffeine. It's the habits that we, that we, um, drink, uh, you know, the habits that surround drinking. Are we drinking to, uh, help lower stress may not be the best option. You know, the first line of resort to help lower stress exercise is great, Good sleeping habits, perhaps, you know, having a therapist or social worker to speak with, um, you know, alcohol can be fine, but it's also how, how we, we drink it. Are we drinking on an empty stomach, which most of us do. We go into a mealtime and we drink before we eat. Eat before you drink, just like, you know, the, the coffee or the caffeine. It's good to get some food in your system, preferably protein. Handful of nuts, hard-boiled eggs, some chicken, some fish, um, you know, a little bit of cheese. I do think it's important to get um, some food in your system. So that way those effects won't be um, as significant. The other thing is the hydration, same as caffeine. We typically drink alcohol and we forget to stay hydrated and, and alcohol is quite dehydrating. So for me, making sure you wanna have two cups of water before you touch your alcohol and then eat that protein and then go for the alcohol, that's great. But for women, the general rule is sticking to a glass of, of a wine, a light. I know, Dara, I think you just froze up a little bit. Uh, Dara, I think we just lost you. Um, you might have to log back in. You guys are gonna get Star right back in a second. Um, just texted her. So this is the fun part of Zoom life. <laughs> um, so Dara is probably logging right back in. I hope you all are finding this as useful as I am. Um, yeah, great discussions, Amy. Thank you. I feel bad that we're not gonna to get to everyone's questions, but um, what we can do is if um, you guys have more, feel free to email me by the end of the night and I'll share those with Dara. And then maybe we can um, have her answer them with, over the course of the week and I'll send an email out later um, by the end of the week. Waiting for Dara to come back in.
For those of you that, oh, here we go. Hey, Dara. Did you get your audio on? I think um, that's the piece that's missing right now. There we go. Uh, so Barry, we just need you to unmute and then you're back in business. Uh, you're still muted. Hi, I'm so sorry about that. I technical difficulties and uh, I appreciate <laughs> everyone's patience. Um, no problem. I'm, I'm happy to be back on and this is a perfect segue into if we have time mm -hmm. to review the food diary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to finish with one thought. So you said for a woman, yeah. it's okay to have like one glass of wine. Um, oh, yes. That's where I cut off. That. So I, I recommend um, sticking to one glass of wine, light beer, tequila, uh, vodka a day. That's the general guideline. And often we, we typically pool a lot of our alcohol and, you know, to the weekend. Um, now I would, I would try your best to limit it to one, perhaps two max, but then that means, you know, two to four cups of water, depending if you stick to that one or two glasses. That generally is what I would suggest when it comes to fertility. And then, you know, if you don't find out that you're pregnant until a little bit later and you've had a drink, that's okay. You wouldn't be the first person. But of course, once you um, you know, realize that you're pregnant and have a positive pregnancy test, I do suggest uh, steering clear from alcohol. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I think this is great to jump into the um, consult. So for those of you who may not be aware, uh, we did offer a raffle to current UVA users that register for the event uh, to have to share their food diary with Dara and then she'll basically give feedback on what's going on there. Um, so and everyone see the shared screen. It's coming through, we... but um, I believe the, the winner was, I might say her name wrong, but is it phone, Viffany? Is that right? It's V Pawn, but you can call me V. V, v. okay. Yeah. Uh, v, you can feel free to turn your video on or off, whatever you like, but the floor is yours with Dara. And sorry, you're having some issues sharing your screen. It's not coming up. Oh, it's not coming up because it shows on my end. Let me see if I can try it one more time. Um, let me see if I can share it right here. And here's the, is this, is, not can easy. anyone see it? Uh, let's do this. Let me share it on my end. Okay. And um, we'll go from there. Give me one second. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, let me start. Should have done this, please. Here we go. All right, so sweet. So, go ahead, I was gonna say, hi, V. I'm, I'm so happy that you sent this to me. This is wonderful. I was glad I was able to participate. <laughs> Great, I, I'm actually very impressed. I have to give you credit where credit is due. <laughs> you are eating throughout the day. You know, it's, it's so, um, it's so interesting that the majority of the women that I work with often skip meals. And I think for, um, 
for, you know, keeping your energy constant throughout the day um, mm-hmm. and to get in all your vitamins and minerals. I think it can be very helpful to get in meals throughout the day. And it's nice to see that you're splitting it up. You're, you're eating every three to four hours. So kudos to you. That's incredible. <laughs> I'm trying, you know. <laughs> and uh, you're a good water drinker. You avoid soda, okay. which is great. Um, and even your, your sleep schedule, it's great to see that you're trying to get in your, your seven, uh, uh, hours or so of sleep. I did notice that your weekday compared to your weekend, you may be falling a little bit short, but you're almost there. If you pushed up your sleep, perhaps with 10, 10, 15, that would be even better. Okay. Um, and you're, and you're staying active and you're doing a combination of workouts, which is wonderful. I think strength training is great for your bones and yoga is great for, for your mental health and, and for, for keeping you long and limber. Mm-hmm. Um, and then let's talk about food. I, I, one thing I noticed, which is also something I don't often see is you are including a source of protein at every single meal. So breakfast, whether it's coming from eggs or from your mixed nuts your lunchtime when you're adding in your beef or your pork or your meatloaf or your chicken fettuccine, um, your, your dinner time, whether you're adding, and you're, you're mixing it up. You have a, var- a wide variety of protein sources, your salmon, which, uh, excuse me, I highly recommend in your turkey. Um, and even in your snack time, what I would say with your snack, I love the idea of the new fruits and nuts because it gives you the combination of protein and carbohydrates. If you choose things that, of course, are maybe a little bit less nutritious, like the candy bar, something sweet, or the chips, ideally, having some protein first would make it even better, and it would help sustain you and fill you up a little bit longer. Okay. So that would be something I recommend. Also, you're going for a carbohydrate um, at lunch and dinner, often in the form of rice. A A healthier swap out would be to switch to brown rice or a quinoa. But of course, if that's something that culturally you've had your whole life and you enjoy having it, that's great. A serving size is a half a cup. A half a cup. So a a, a half a cup (laughs) is the size of your fish. And that's tough because most of us, we make it the main focus. It's the same thing with pasta. We make it the main (laughs) focus of our meal as opposed Mm -hmm. to use it as an accessory to your meal. Make it 25% of your plate. If you're taking that away, what does that mean? More green beans, more vegetables more of the Brussels sprouts. Okay. And I think that ratio and that balance would be a huge benefit to you, V. But I have to say you are on the right path. I think it's great to see that you um, include protein at every meal. You're not afraid of vegetables. When you do go for like, there's certain carbohydrates like your Ezekiel bread, that's a wonderful choice because it's a sprouted grain that has mm-hmm. lots of fiber in it. You could even in the morning, grits, which are, are, are similar to white rice, aren't going to give you the longer lasting, uh, sustainable uh, fiber carbs. So you may um, want to swap that out sometimes for oatmeal or even sprinkling some flax or chia seeds over your eggs. Um, But I do think that swap out from grits to oatmeal would be a much higher fiber um, quality uh, breakfast to, to have with your scrambled eggs. Okay. And then I think though there's one more, if we have time, I, I would love to, to touch upon there, your weekend. So weekend, typically less structured, um, often much more fast food. Um, mm-hmm. And for me, what often gets lost in the weekend is the vegetable component. And so that's what I'm seeing a little bit here that, you know, and that could be somewhat challenging when we go for fast food. I know, you know, when you go to McDonald's, it's probably not the most exciting thing to get a side, of, a side salad. But if you don't get a side salad, even if it means when you're at home before you go for lunch, you know, whether you have some cut up crudite, some carrots some celery, dip it with some hummus or guacamole, that can be a great way to get it in. If you do go to a restaurant um, and, you know, your lunch was devoid or very lacking in vegetables, okay, that happens here and there. At dinner time, you may want to, you know, at a restaurant, ask them to swap out the carbohydrate, that rice or the potatoes for an extra green vegetable. So that's also a great way to balance um, a meal out or a day out. If your lunch consisted of chicken nuggets and, and French fries and you didn't want to opt for the, for the salad there. Um, and I would say try to go for uh, or minimize your, your intake of fried food. So fried food should be a once in a blue moon thing. And it often should be best paired with 
a great vegetable, like a grill, like, you know, a grilled okra as opposed to the fried okra. That also would make it more well-rounded. I'm still happy you had okra, even if it was fried. Um, but it's good to see you're still eating your breakfast. And that's something I often, people have more of a brunch uh, on a weekend. Keep up that breakfast. I do think it's a great way to start the day and set the tone for your eating habits the rest of the day. And then certain things, if you want to have your chips here and there, best chosen on a day where maybe you don't have the, the fried food or the fast food. And if you do have the fast food and you want something crunchy, a popcorn, like a skinny pop popcorn or the Buddha bowl popcorn is a great alternative. But I'm all for those pickles. They taste good. They have a nice crunch. They're a little salty. So you just keep drinking water. It usually helps make sure that you drink enough water. Um, and it's nice to see that you're active and you're still getting good quality sleep. So I have to say, kudos to you, bravo, bravo to you, V. You're doing a really good job. Thank you. Uh, v, did you have any specific questions for Dara uh, while we have her? Uh, no, I think she touched on everything that I probably did have a question about because I thought that my diary was going to be all over the place and I didn't think I was going to get, you know, good standing. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to know that at least I'm on the right path. And that's all it is. It's progress, not perfection. And I always think mm -hmm. it's great to keep one or two goals a week. So for you, perhaps your goal can be to um, to, to up your vegetables and, and make your, your, your rice a little bit smaller portion. That's a great start in the right direction. And perhaps the second one is to add, incorporate some form of, of fiber in the morning, whether it's coming from flax or chia or a bran cracker or a bran cereal. I think those two things are um, great, easy, um, realistic changes that can help um, keep you on the right path. Okay, thank you. You're so welcome. Well, thank you so much, Dara. Um, when you hopped off, I uh, actually opened up uh, an invitation to all of our guests to send me whatever questions they may have um, by the end of the evening and I'll share them with you. So hopefully we can just respond back to them via email. I would um, absolutely love that. Great, um, but thank you so much for your time. I know we went a little bit over. Um, this was incredibly helpful to me and I hope to the rest of the, the people that joined as well. Um, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for everyone's patience when my, when everything went off. So uh, thank you so much for, for staying on and, and for partaking. All right. Well, guys, uh, stay tuned for our next event, which will be next month. Um, we're looking forward to, you'll, you'll hear more about it. Uh, just follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we'll be promoting it everywhere. Um, until next time. Thanks, everyone.